The U.S. launched its so-called war on terror in the wake of 9-11. Invasions of Afghanistan and Iraq followed with huge loss of life. Instability spread across many parts of the Middle East. So what's been the true impact? This is Inside Story. Hello there and welcome to the program. I'm Nastasia Tay. Now, after US President George W. Bush launched what he labeled the War on Terror in 2001, for people in countries like Afghanistan and Iraq, years of violence, death, destruction and political instability were to follow. Thousands were also detained and illegally taken to other countries, many tortured or subjected to brutal treatment and held for years without trial. Resistance grew and pushed the US and NATO out of Afghanistan two years ago. A new investigation from a top U.S. university says more than 4.5 million people died, directly or indirectly, from the so-called war on terror. We'll be discussing its legacy with the report's author and our guests in just a few moments, but first this report from Alexandra Byers on how it all began. It's been more than two decades since the 9-11 attacks. That morning was followed by two devastating and costly wars. In November 2001, the U.S. led an international coalition to invade Afghanistan, accusing the Taliban of harboring al-Qaeda fighters. It launched a huge bombing campaign and a ground operation. Tens of thousands of people were killed and millions more displaced. In 2003, the U.S. attacked Iraq as part of its so-called war on terror, accusing its leader of stockpiling weapons of mass destruction. Saddam Hussein and his regime will stop at nothing until something stops him. The war plunged the country into sectarian violence and toppled Saddam Hussein. The weapons of mass destruction were never found. Major combat operations in Iraq have ended. In the Battle of Iraq, the United States and our allies have prevailed. George Bush's declaration of victory was made before the worst violence in Iraq was yet to come. The legacy of both invasions brought disastrous consequences for people in the region. But the so-called war on terror was never declared over, and wounds it inflicted have not healed. A new study by the Costs of War Project at Brown University estimates the post-9-11 wars and their ongoing impact have led to more than 4.5 million deaths. The scope of the report includes conflicts in places like Pakistan, Syria, Somalia and Yemen. There are no official statistics for the numbers who died in the so-called War on Terror. But the report says there are more indirect deaths than combat fatalities. Indirect deaths are blamed on things like the breakdown of economic, environmental and psychological conditions. More than 20 years since the war in Afghanistan, the Taliban are back in power after a hasty U.S. and NATO withdrawal almost two years ago. International donors have frozen Afghan bank reserves and its health system is on the brink of collapse. The report asks, in a place like Afghanistan, can any death today be considered unrelated to the U.S. war? And what long-lasting impact will it continue to have on these countries? Alexandra Byers for Inside Story. Well, let's now bring in our guests in New York. Stephanie Saville, the co-director of The Costs of War, a non-partisan non research project based at the Watson Institute for International and Public Affairs at Brown University and an author of the report. In Manchester, in the United Kingdom, Ruba Ali Al-Hassani, a postdoctoral research fellow at Lancaster University and also co-founder of the Iraqi Women Academics Network. And in Bethesda, Maryland, Michael O'Hanlon, a senior fellow and director of research and foreign policy at the Brookings Institution. A very warm welcome to all of you and thanks for joining us today on Inside Story. And Steph, this is your report, I, so I'll start with you. More than 4.5 million deaths, that's a really startling number. It's obviously something very difficult to quantify. How did you get to that number? 
Yeah, this is something that uh, the Cost of War Project has been working on for years. Actually, I've been I've built on the work of colleagues of mine at the Cost of War Project. For a long time, my colleague Nita Crawford has generated a uh, regularly updated estimate of what direct deaths. So these are people who are killed through the weapons of war, through fire, the actual combat of war. Um, that now is up to uh, 906,000 to 937,000. That's the range that she estimates uh, of direct deaths. So my report builds on that. It uses a ratio from the Geneva Declaration Secretariat that uh, current day wars, there's an estimate of about uh, four indirect deaths for every direct death. Um, I dug in very deeply to research across many fields, including epidemiology and public health research. And basically, this is the best latest information that's out there. Ideally, in an ideal scenario, there would be teams of researchers on the ground, local researchers doing excess mortality studies, at going you know house house to house, doing a sur surveys of you know who's died in the past X number of years to get a better, more precise figure. But in the absence of those studies, and those are really hard to do in war zones, there's a, a you know absence of uh, birth and death uh, certificates and and all of, of those sorts of basic uh, census data. Um, this kind of ratio is the is the best that's out there. So um, that was how we generated the 4.5 trillion. A million figure. Well, the so-called war on terror itself is a bit of a nebulous concept. Can I ask, Stephanie, how you chose the conflicts that you've included? Yes, absolutely. This is something also drawing on this cost of war project framing. So this is, a you know, over 60 scholars at this point from around the world. What we've done is we've said, you know, the U.S. counterterrorism has played a role, not just in Afghanistan, Pakistan and Iraq, um, those were, you know, the U.S.-led wars in those places, but also a very significant role in Syria, Yemen, Somalia, mm -hmm. Libya, um, and other places increasingly. The footprint of the U.S. so-called war on terror uh, it continues. And um, so this is really a framing that tries to look very comprehensively at you know, of course, these conflicts are incredibly complex. We're not saying that the U.S. is the only responsible party. We're mm -hmm. merely pointing to the fact that there's been an intensification of the violence as a result of U.S. counterterrorism efforts. And this report is really an attempt to come to terms and grapple with that sense of responsibility. Sure. Uh, Ruba, I understand you were born in the diaspora, but you've been working with people in Iraq on the ground there for many years. Do any of these numbers surprise you? No, the numbers are not surprising. They're damning, if anything. Uh, and I am tempted to think that the numbers may be even higher, uh, that these may be um, for the lack of a better word, conservative maybe, or just like Stephanie said, that you know, there are many deaths that are unrecorded. There are many missing people who are unrecorded. Um, I'm currently working on a project on enforced disappearances in Iraq. So that's another issue that has been um, a tremendously um, problematic um, aspect of life that many Iraqis have had to endure since 2003. Uh, so the numbers make sense, and I assume that they're much more, especially in countries like Afghanistan and in Syria now with its own conflict going on. Uh, Michael, turning to you, I know that you've previously said that the so-called war on terror, for all of its failures, has had a number of limited successes, accidental as some of them may actually be. But that success, as you've described it, I understand, has been specifically around preventing attacks on American soil. But this is then the trade-off, right? 4.5 million deaths? First of all, let me congratulate Stephanie and her colleagues at the Watson Center. They've done very good work over the years at reminding us that we have to take a broader perspective in understanding the consequences of war. And I generally agree with most of the methodologies. We can talk about some specifics in a minute. But well, let me make that point. Second, you're correct to argue or to, to summarize the writings that I've done to say that when we think about a 22-year campaign against you know, Salafism or however you'd like to describe the broader Al-Qaeda 
and related movements around the world. The United States and its Western allies have generally been fairly fortunate in that the number of subsequent attacks on American or even European soil has been quite modest compared to the fears we all had after 9-11. And of course, there have been some attacks, most notably some of the ISIS attacks in Europe in the middle part of the last decade. But generally speaking, if you want to do a plus minus cost benefit assessment of the so-called war on terror, which may not be a good term, but um, you know, is often still employed, then I think we have to say that Western countries have done pretty well at protecting themselves, certainly from anything like the catastrophic terror we saw on 9-11. And then even in Spain in 2004 or London in 2005, some of the other uh, attacks or in Bali, Indonesia uh, in 2002. Sure. But I, you do very well, and Stephanie does very well, uh, as well as our colleague in London, to remind people, uh, and of course, in the broader Middle East, people need no reminding, that these wars have had huge human consequences. And that war itself, because it breaks down society, because it breaks down health care, it impedes proper nutrition, uh, it impedes economic growth. It therefore contributes to a lot of indirect deaths that wind up outnumbering direct combat deaths. And Stephanie's right, just to remind people, it's roughly this four to one ratio. That's a very crude and rough number. It's, a, it's an average across many different countries, many different conflicts. But the general message is correct, that war leads to far more indirect consequences than we even see directly on our TV screens. And that's a tragedy of conflict. It should make anyone wary of war. The, the one last thing I'll say, however, is that bearing in mind that the Iraq of Saddam Hussein was hardly a peaceful place, bearing in mind that the Afghanistan of the Taliban was hardly a successful country uh, and is hardly successful today, that these excess deaths that we're talking about often would have been occurring even without the U.S.-led interventions. And I know Stephanie is quick to underscore that she's not simply blaming the United States or its broader war on terror for all of these casualties. But I do want to underscore that when we think about excess deaths, having looked at, again, Iraq under Saddam in his quarter century of terrible rule, or the Taliban in Afghanistan with the kind of healthcare systems and oppression of women's rights and limitations on economic progress that they imposed, uh, it's not as if these places would have had peaceful and happy futures if they had been left on their own trajectories. Uh, the last point I would say, however, is that Libya strikes me as a place that probably would have done better without us, mm -hmm. that probably would have truly been, despite Muammar Gaddafi's limitations and, and uh, his own barbaric acts at times against his own people, Libya was a semi-functioning country during his rule, and it's been worse since our 2011 intervention. So again, we have to bear down case sure. by case, but I, I agree I, with the overall thrust. Thank I you. I want to bring Ruba in here because it looked very much like she wanted to respond to you there, Michael. Yes, thank you. Um, I think the key point, and what Michael has said, is that the West has been capable of protecting itself. That's the key word, itself, um, because since 2003, not just Iraq and Afghanistan, but the entire Middle East and uh, parts of uh, South uh, West Asia have been um, unprotected and have been violated over and over in various ways, uh, whether it's murder or rape or torture or continued uh, legacy uh, and reverberations of this violence that continues in many, uh, various forms. Till this day, children are born in Fallujah and Basra in Iraq with co uh, congenital birth defects because of white phosphorus uh, use uh, and depleted uranium in Iraq. Those are, you know, weapons uh, like white phosphorus is an illegal uh, use. Um, sorry, it's an illegal chemical um, if used in warfare.